It's how do I grow money without working more hours? The whole soccer analogy is, you know, your defense is keeping you safe. Your midfield is moving you forward, but slowly. And the forwards are the ones that are risky. But, you know, if you don't use them, utilize them from time to time, you're missing out on like larger amounts of, uh, of capital for the future. Welcome to What I Meant to Say. I'm your host, Wendy Jones, founder of Be Better Media and a mom of four, passionate about human connection. Throughout my journey, I have experienced many What I Meant to Say moments. But since life doesn't give us do-overs, I've created a space to reflect and tell our stories again with a little more grace for ourselves and the hope that we can help others and be better for having listened. Welcome to What I Meant to Say. I'm your host, Wendy Jones, and I'm here today with Pete Urich, co-author of Setting and Scoring Financial Goals. He and his co-author figured out a way to bridge the game of soccer and teaching financial goals to um, actually younger athletes, right? Your your, your target audience is the younger younger set. Am I right on that? Yeah, 100%. I mean, we could, you could apply to anybody who uh, understands the game of soccer, but our target demographic is around 16 to 26 Basically, the idea is to give a financial education that I personally never got when I was younger to, you know, this next generation as they're, you know, reaching the end of high school or in college or heading into the workplace. Well, as the mother of four, I was really, really excited when we connected because I I truly believe I along with you, I I did not have that type of background. Nobody taught me those things younger. And as I'm starting to raise, you know, my kids are now in high school and in college, we've had more and more conversations around this topic. And I do and you know, it takes a lot of leadership to really hit this topic well. And I don't think I think so often it's overlooked until, you know, sometimes you can get into difficult situations and then have have the conversation and as as with anything it's so much easier when you you are proactive so that's why i was i was really attracted to the concept of your book and really curious you know how did you and your co-author chris start um, you know get into this topic and and how did you connect uh so chris and i went to college together we played soccer uh at salisbury university down in uh, maryland and we've been best friends since 1994 um uh, our our background uh, goes back that far, but basically the book itself was born out of the pandemic to a certain extent. Uh, you know, there were a few different reasons uh, that I was getting more invested in my own finances and just trying to learn a little bit more. And Chris is a financial planner, has is a CPA, and all of that stuff. So who better to learn about finances from than my best friend? And as we were talking it through, I was like, well, how could I make this even easier on myself to learn? I was like, well, what if, what if we were to relate this to soccer in some way? We both love the sport. We both played. Our kids play. And so it was like, all right, if I could come up with a way that this overlapped with soccer, it would just make getting that concept down just that much easier. So as we started talking about it, then it was like, all right, well, well I think we can turn this into a book. And we just slowly but surely, it, it, it took time. It took a lot longer than we ever anticipated, but the ideas started coming together and basically we came up with a framework that explains personal finance to somebody who, you know, if you find finances intimidating, but you've played soccer before, you'll get the overall idea of, all right, this is a lot more simple of a game, meaning finances, than I ever thought it was, but people get themselves intimidated because it's, you know, it's their money. And also we have a tendency to let our emotions get the best of us in the buying of, uh, of things and stuff. It's, it's one of the first uh, few chapters, it's possession, not possessions. And so, you know, if you know anything about soccer, you've probably heard of the guy, uh, who's in Miami now, Lionel Messi. He's one of the best players in the history of the game. He played for Barcelona. And when he was on Barcelona's team, their whole entire strategy was we keep the ball more than the other team. We want to have the ball 80% of the time, 90% of the time. And they were one of the best teams in the world because of it. And so that's one of the major concepts that we started off with was possession, not possessions. Keeping possession of your money because anytime that you're spending money, you're giving it away usually to the other team. Now, if you're putting money into something like you know insurance, which is protective, that's part of your defense or you're putting it into a stock, 
which is part of your offense, you know, one of your forwards, then you have the possibility of getting that money back as opposed to, I just went down the street and bought Starbucks. Now that $5 is in Starbucks' pocket, not my pocket. And so being a little bit more discerning about where it is that you're putting your money and taking some of those longer term strategies where I'm going to, rather than give giving uh, $200 a month to Starbucks, I'm going to put a portion of that into my own pocket so that it can grow over time. And maybe later on, I can own Starbucks or something. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's it's so interesting the way, I mean, our emotions get, get wrapped up both in sports and in finances. And I think so often people have kind of a fear-based mindset when it comes to to finances. And I'm really curious to know if you, do you guys dig into that at all um, in the book? It's it's actually one of the very first things that we talk about uh, is, you know, managing your emotions because of the fact that, you know, as a parent, I'm sure you can understand the, uh, you know, the, the aisles at the checkout of a grocery store where they have some of the aisles that don't have candy there and everything because of the fact that the kids, you know, it's real simple, you know, they, they see the candy they instantaneously want. And as a parent, you feel that, oh my gosh, I got to get them something or whatever. But that emotional control becomes like one of the most important things that you can possibly have because of the fact that you have to make a decision about, all right, where is this money going? I just had whatever money is, you know, important to you, whether it's $10, $100, $1,000, you know, whatever is going to hit you hard in the, in the pocket, it's how much am I thinking about where I'm putting that money? Because if you just do it without thinking, it's, oh, I, I go to Starbucks every single morning just because. And I keep on using that as a as an example, but I don't go to uh, Starbucks. I don't drink coffee. So, but, you know, I, I do this just out of habit. Well, maybe you should develop some better habits about where it is that you're putting money. Now, I'm not judgmental because, you know, that $5, maybe it's worth it to you because of the, you know, the emotional investment or you go to Starbucks every day and you meet your mom or something like that for that. Maybe that money's worth it, but most people don't even think about it. They just go to the emotional, I need my coffee, I want my coffee, I got my coffee. And we're trying to get you to think a little bit more you know, about where it is that you're putting that money and are you emotionally attached to something that really isn't serving you. Yeah, absolutely. And what are some, what are some of the ways you could, you think, um, you know, when you're talking to the younger set, what are some of the advantages of teaching, um, you know, say a 16 year old, some of these lessons? Well, the thing about teaching a 16 year old as a 46 year old, I'm 47, you know, it's, it's, uh, you have the possibility of compounding the benefits of learning about this early. So, you know, we'll just use the, uh, example of, a 22 year old kid, you know, you've got, you've got a 22 year old kid. They just graduated from college. They get their first job and they're in the best situation possibly if they're, you know, living with their parents, sharing an apartment with three other people. When you're at that level of your life, you have the ability to keep your expenses extremely low. One of the things that, you know, you and I have to do because we've got kids and we've got uh, a huge amount of responsibilities we've got to make sure that our defense is taken care of first because of the fact that I need health insurance because of the, my, the fact that I've got kids, I need to take care of that first. But a 22 year old kid has the ability to rather than $200 a month into health insurance because their parents have still got them on the policy. It's put that into, you know, a stock, a, you know, an R IRA or something along those lines where it's you're thinking long term. And that $100 a month that you're not going to miss, if you can just let that compound over time, it ends up being hundreds of thousands, maybe even millions of dollars, depending on how consistent you are with it. So making sure that you know, you're know you making those decisions early as opposed to you're 46 and now you're trying to get your, uh, your financial life in balance and you don't have any, any like, you know, basis for it. You, you're already behind the game because yeah. you've lost a whole bunch of games. We, I don't know you're, if you're a soccer fan at all. Yeah, I'm a huge Ted Lasso fan. So <laughs> you're a huge Ted Lasso fan. Okay. So what, you know, as you, as you saw in Ted Lasso is most of the leagues in, uh, in Europe are 24 teams, which means you have 46 games. All right. 
That was I'm doing the math for you. Trust me on it. <laughs> You've got a 46 game season. If you're a 22 year old kid, 46 plus 22, that's 66. That's retirement age. So you think of every year as a in air quotes game. And how do you win the game? You end up at the end of the year with more money than you started it with. So that's the whole entire idea. And some people are going to have more aggressive goals, but at the beginning, you know, if you're in your 20s uh, and you're spending all your money on, you know, beach houses and all of that stuff, and you're ending up in the red for, you know, 10 years, 15 years or whatever, and then later on, you don't have the ability to put money into your growth things like your forwards, the uh, stocks and, and buying into small businesses and stuff, then you're in a situation where you're so, so far behind, you can't become one of those elite teams. You're in you know, last place or whatever. Not that you're comparing yourself to other people, but you're trying to, you know, make sure that your financial house is in order from the time that you're 22, not the time when you're 46. Yeah. It makes so much sense because I do think we get to that point of life where, you know, whatever habits we've ingrained, if you have to change them at, at say our age, it is, it's a process of unlearning versus, Mm -hmm. you know, when you're 22 and fresh and you have energy and, focus and like you were saying, a much simpler lifestyle, it's a matter of building those habits, right? So what are some of those habits that you think incrementally are most helpful um, to someone that was coming out? Yeah. So, you know, the the first thing that we did was we, we turned all of the asset classes into positions. And then also on the other team, you've got, you know, things like taxes, um, emotional spending, all of that. Those are your defenders on the other team. So in the back of the book, we have uh, two worksheets that are your assets, which are your team, and then your liabilities, which are on the other team. And so going through and actually breaking down, where is my money going? You know, I made $2,000, $5,000 this month, whatever the amount of money is, where is it going? Just that simple process of building the skill into your into your like monthly process or if you're doing it quarterly or whatever, it's where did all of my money go? All right. And if you can at bare minimum look at that, it's one of those reasons like, you know, if if people were doing it for a long time, you know, taking a picture of all your food, it's you want to track what's coming in uh, in order to, uh, you know, get better habits about what you're eating, same thing applies for this is where's my money going every single month and why is it going there? You know, there's nothing wrong with making decisions about where it is that you want it, the, the money to go. Again, going back to the Starbucks uh, uh, example, it's like, if that's important to you, that's completely fine, but you're making that decision. You're not just doing it out of, out of habit. So that's one of the, one of the like absolute first steps is where is everything going? Because that's assessing where you are. And then it's, well, what are the things that you want to give up in in regards to like how many, how many times do I give the ball away to the other team? When where can I learn to not give that ball away? You know, whether it is the, you know, I've got too many streaming services and I'm getting rid of a couple of those. Um, <laughs> all know yeah. um, or it's, you know, how much longer can I have my uh, my car that I is not particularly ideal, but it's paid off? How much longer can I stick that out as opposed to getting a car payment? You know, figuring out where your money's going and then making decisions about all right. Now that I've decided to hang on to that, now what's the best best place to put that within my team so that I am in a better position? Because although we would all love to say, okay, well I'm just going to put all of my money into the stock market, that's not always the best maneuver either, you know, because there's risk that comes along with that reward and you've got to figure out whether or not that's the right, uh, the right place to put your money. So that's where I would start. Yeah. I like all of that. And I think another thing that's coming to mind is just like, like you say, everyone has different priorities, right? And, and rather than being, it's a, it's it seems to me it's about being mindful of what you prioritize right and how if you don't know where you're spending your money how can you know you know what you really value so mm-hmm. do you have any tips on you know really helping pe- people figure out like what do you really value how do you figure that out 
uh, I mean, for Chris might have a totally different answer with him being the CPA and the uh, and the certified financial planner and everything. I'm the analogy guy. I was the one who decided to you know bring this all into the soccer world. So you know his his financial advice is probably uh, the one that you want to follow a little bit more. But ultimately, um, you know, for building out that what am I going to do with, uh, with, or what are the decisions that I'm making about my money? Where, what do I care about? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that first step of, uh, you know, writing down where your expenses are going, those probably are the things that you, to a certain extent care about, but also, you know, I think that the, uh, for lack of a better term, media has gotten really good at selling us on what we should want, not particularly what we do want, but what we should want. And, you know, I I came up in the age of, you know, cassettes and then CDs and then, well, actually records and cassettes, then CDs. And then, uh, you know, we're in the streaming services and everything like that. But the thing that uh, that has, has not changed, you know, the technology keeps on changing, but people are still, you know, for me, the most important thing. And so it ends up being, what are the relationships that I care about? What are the things, the activities that I care about doing? And once you figure out like, what are your priorities in those areas? Because those things aren't going to change. Your technology, I, I don't even want to know what is going to happen in five years. But, but yeah. the thing is, is, you know, what are, what are the things that you value now? You know, who are the people that you want to be around? What are the things that you want to do? Um, one of the things that I used to do with my students all the time, I'm a teacher. Um, oh, cool. it, yeah, is... Uh, I would put on the board uh, a Venn diagram of do, have, no, which is, you know, the things that you do are things that people will pay you money for. The things that you have are things that you people, tell you people will pay you money for and no. So the things that you want to have in your life, the things, all right, prioritize those, figure out which ones you actually care about. All right. If you actually care about cars, that's fine. Just make sure that that's a thing that you're prioritizing. All right. What do you want to do with your time? What, you know, you've got uh, weekends and holidays and everything like that. What is it that you actually do? And can you get more out of that rather than putting your money into something that you care about a lot less? You know, it, why do we go to the go to the beach every summer? Because that's what my family always did. Well, what if you don't value that as much? You know, um, a lot of us have ingrained habits that we picked up from our parents. So, you know, doing a real assessment of, all right, well, do we have to go to the beach every single summer? Maybe yeah. something that's a little bit different and more cost effective for what you're trying to do. Do we need to own a house or can we, you know, rent something to do the same thing at the, uh, to get the same result from the, uh, 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 probably a lesser payout? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. I know people don't. Yeah. There are so many costs attached to us as adults. We realize that I think when you're teaching this to a younger subset, you don't always see the long-term costs that are associated with, you know, choices that we make. And I think, um, you know, like as a home, I'm a homebody, right? So I look at where, what I'm doing and I've always really valued my home. Some people would rather have a lot more experiences and you know, maybe a, a different type of home, but I think finances are just another way of, it's another deep dive on self-awareness if we allow it to be. Yeah. And I think it's not, it's not always viewed that way because it can be a very practical subject, but truthfully, I think it's the emotional part of it where people get hung up. Yeah. And, you know, being able to, to, to break it down the way that you guys have is it's, it, it could be really helpful because I think helping people realize how um, how their emotions are wrapped up in yeah. the choices that they're making and, and the whole entire thing is is you know i don't think a lot of people realize what money is it's portable power that's it it's the ability to buy stuff buy experiences and everything you do not want pictures of dead presidents you don't that's not why you want money if you wanted that, you could print those off of your, off of your uh, laser printer or whatever and have that no problem. But what you want is the ability to do whatever the money is going to do for you. So a lot of people, you know, I want a million dollars. Why do you want that million dollars? Because of the fact that you want to be able to do this thing. And if we, again, if you break it down to um, your 
you keep on asking the question, why? You know, all right, well, I want a million dollars. Why do you want a million dollars so I can buy this car? Why do you want to buy that car? Eventually, you're going to get down to that root feeling of, I want the, I want this thing because it makes me feel good. Well, if we can right. figure out how to feel good before we get the thing, then we have to do a little bit less of that getting the thing, figuring out how how it is that we make ourselves feel good regardless of the you know car that we're driving or whatever. You know, you can do those things to accentuate it, but yeah. ultimately you're you're in control of that. Well, and also realizing that money, you know, I've heard it said that money um really accentuates personalities, right? Yes. I mean, you are who you are and you add money to it, you're going to be more of who you are. Yes. So I that's another reason I love the concept of teaching this younger because as we're figuring out who we are and what we're about, doing that before money is is so front and center in our lives and we're we're developing a healthier relationship to it rather than letting it define us. Does yeah. That make sense? Oh, it makes perfect sense. I mean, Absolutely. And, you know, especially when you're, when you're younger, you have that ability to still decide on a path. But once you've gone down that path of, you know, all right, well, I'm going to be a corporate lawyer and I've gone to school for however many years and I've battled in order to become partner as quickly as I possibly could. Once you're invested in that road, it's hard to get off of it and recognize the fact that, oh, well, you know, I really just wanted to be happy for this reason or this or, or that reason. But because of the fact that I started down this path, now I'm kind of stuck on it. And uh, Gary V is the one who probably goes into this uh, the most is like, you know, would you rather be the miserable CEO who's making, you know, half a million dollars or the guy who's making 70 K and you love your life because you're doing exactly what it is that you want to do, you know, that juxtaposition is one that I think that we're getting a little bit better at looking at those two things and realizing that, you know, being a child, I was born in the seventies, but being part of the eighties, it's, you know, everything was about getting rich and having the things and everything like that. And I think we're starting to recognize that that's not the end all be all that was sold to uh, a lot of us. And so now trying to move in a different direction is, and having the ability to do things like you and I are doing right here, it's, you know, 30 years ago, I probably wouldn't be an author writing a book that was like this because it never would have gotten published because uh, soccer and finances, they're going to throw that out the window. And then also, you know, you and I being able to talk like this, is, we live on right. other sides of the country. So, you know, all of these things, the walls are breaking down uh, on a lot of the things that we thought were the way things were supposed to be. And now we have the ability to look at it. And that's, again, our hope, Chris and, and my to educate kids about what is it that money truly is and how can you use it effectively so that it, you're heading in the direction that you want to go, not particularly the way that we want to go. Cause you know, we use the metaphor of being the manager of, of a soccer team. And it's like, you've got to set the tone on, on what it is that you want to do. And if you want to be an all out offense, I'm going to go for, you know, all stocks and try and, you know, make all my money that way. That's completely fine. But just recognize that you're the one who's making this decision. None of this is 100% advice. We put the ideas out there to explain them. And then you've got to make the decisions because we can't make the decisions for you. And, you know, so many people, we've seen it throughout the years, MC Hammer and everything like that. When they let other people make their monetary decisions for them, they usually ended up in a problem. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, it really does come back to knowing yourself and your priorities, right? And then having that healthy relationship with yourself so that the money is not defining you. You are just, to me, you know, I think there's a very, I know there's a study out there. There's a huge, have you seen the study on happiness? So basically the gap of happiness, uh, it's around 70,000. I don't know if they've done it uh, for inflation now, but basically around 70K where you, the money no longer impacts your uh, your ha- happiness. Up until 70K, it's basically there's there's a correlation between people's happiness and their uh, monetary uh, income. But at the, at that 70K um, dollar amount, that's where you kind of cap out where the money's not making you happier anymore. It's all about your decisions and everything like that. Yeah, I think because that's- you got your basic needs taken care of and then it's just figuring out 
What are your priorities? Who is it that you want to be? What? How do you want to spend your time? And I think I think the the younger that people can realize that. And granted, we're I always I love teaching lessons. You know the, that that concept of generational wisdom I'm so drawn to. And I think there's something about yes, we have to be a certain age because we take things in differently at different ages. But I think there's something about finances that it can be such a black and white Be, I think as we get older, so much more gets attached to it. So when I was thinking about your concept, I'm like, well, when you're teaching it younger, it really can be so much simpler. Mm-hmm. And then letting those habits build in such a simple way where we don't have all of these security and um, like shame attached to the decisions we're making or how did we get over here and how did we... Yeah, just being able to peel it back and boil it down just seems so much more practical to me. Yeah, and the thing is, is you're in a, you're at that point, you know, if you're able to get somebody into this conversation at 16, where they're still in the nest, they can, you know, oh, I just, I've got a summer job. I just made, you know, a hundred bucks or whatever. What are you going to do with that money? And if mom or dad have allowed you to the uh, freedom to, okay, well, Let's invest that and see what happens or let's put that in the bank and see what happens because of the fact that, you know, there was almost no financial education. You were getting it all from your parents. And so now that ability to as a 16, 18, whatever year old, you know, being able to say, all right, I just made some money. Here's what I want to do with it. And there's almost no repercussions whatsoever, because if you lose that hundred dollars or whatever the amount is. It doesn't matter. You're not going to starve to death. You're not going to, you know, get kicked out of your apartment or anything. Mom and dad are still there to, you know, take on uh, most of the defensive responsibilities for you. So that's why introducing this concept early is spectacular. And, you know, the idea of how do I grow money, not just today, you know, that I need to work more hours. It's how do I grow money without working more hours? How do I grow my money without, you know, having it be a straight up transaction for I need to give up this for this? Yeah. Yeah. It's a fascinating concept. And you do hear about, I mean, there's so many ways in the world now, like you were saying, remote and, but just those decisions we make younger and having the time for the money to grow and just being used to that being the decision. Like I always put a little bit away. Or, mm-hmm. you know, those things are, it's it, it's a real game changer with the number of years that you, you make those choices. So, yep. yeah. You start five years earlier, you're going to, you know, exponentially grow your amount of money depending on how you invest it and everything like that. And there's safe investments. It's, you know, again, the whole, the whole, uh, the whole soccer analogy is, you know, your defense is keeping you safe. Your midfield is moving you forward, but slowly. And the forwards are the ones that are risky, but you know, if you don't use them, utilize them from time to time, you're missing out on like larger amounts of uh, of capital for the future. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Makes a lot of sense. Do you, do you talk to your kids um, since you've written this book? Do you talk to your kids more about finances? Um, so I have talked to my kids a lot more about uh, finances just because of the fact that, you know, A, they're getting older. My kids are both in high school right now. And B, my son had his first like true job over the summer. And so um, just having the ability to have that talk of, all right, let's think about whether or not this is actually the thing that you want to do, because it's real easy when it's mom and dad's money to say, oh, I want the new shiny thing. I want the Xbox five. I want the, you know, whatever. But as soon as it's your money, then you need to be a little bit more discerning because you're not going to recoup that. You're not getting another summer job until next summer. So what are you doing with this money for the next year? Um, and how how are you going to allocate it? Um, my son did ask me because he was in the star, stock market club last year. And, okay. he, and he's like, can I invest some of my money? I'm like, not on your own because you're not 18 yet. But yeah. you know, we can, we can definitely have that discussion um, and whether or not that's the right maneuver or not. You know, ultimately, yes, that is a discussion that is having that I'm having more, especially with my son who uh, actually plays soccer. Um, but the intention is eventually to, 
We're going to go from soccer, which is my sport and uh, Chris's sport as well. And then we're going to do football and then we're going to do basketball and then we're going to do baseball. And we're going to try and make our way through the, uh, you know, popular sports in order to make it more pervasive rather than just, oh, well, there's this great book that explains, you know, soccer uh, and finance. Well, I don't like soccer and I'm not going to read anything, you know, even though I liked Ted Lasso, I'm not going <laughs> to not going to bother with uh, with a soccer book. So, um, you know, I think that the American public uh, will really latch on, especially to the uh, football book because of the fact that soccer and football are really, really similar, despite the fact that I know that people view them as very different, but there's a lot of overlap there that we, we can get it. The one I'm going to have to figure out eventually is the volleyball. Okay. Well, we'll we'll help. We'll help you with that one. (laughs) Thank you a little time. We'll start thinking about that. But you said your daughter plays, so you should, she can help you. And Yeah, I'll be sitting there in a game at some point when she's playing, and I'll have some kind of an epiphany that, oh, my gosh, this is how it's going to work. But yeah, uh, it should be relatively simple. It's just, you know, coming up with the right analogy um, yeah. in order to make it. All we're doing is we're taking something that people view as complex and trying to make it simple. That's it. And you say you sound like um, being the metaphor guy. So have you always been kind of a, a game of lifer as an athlete? Have you always seen those lessons that you learned on the on the field play out um, in your life? Or I, I, I don't know that I, I I won't use the word always, but um, ever since I've been a coach, for sure, um, I, I have definitely uh, done it. As I as I got along in my uh, playing career, uh, probably in my you know twenties, it started to become like more and more prevalent of the of the fact that you know I'm not just playing this game for you know the idea of wins and losses and everything. It's this is actually a thing that uh, is going to impact the rest of my life. You know, I'm not I'm not a soccer player anymore. I'm still a coach, but you know I don't play that uh, that much anymore. But that sport has impacted my life way more than any other influencing factor, you know, and I would almost, I, I don't know if I'm going to really think this, uh, it, this is true or not, but like, even to the point of like school and stuff like that, I, I, I know that school's important. I'm a, I'm an educator. I'm a teacher. I, I love education. I think that it's extremely important, but you know, a lot of what I've picked up from like perseverance and stuff. And my first two books were soccer and life overlapped. Um, so that was, that was, uh, the first book was fill your boots, which was like a whole bunch of like miniature, uh, stories about like how soccer and life overlap. And then the second book, I really hammered it home with soccer life balance, which was, you know, coming up with the metaphors of like, you know, some of the daily practices that you talk about is, you know, inflating the ball. Well, that's your breathing exercise and things like that. And then talking about um, about lining the field and like how some of us like have a, a really small field because we've boxed ourselves in based on thoughts that we have about who we are and what we're capable of. And that's, you know, one of those things where people are living in a very small box and they have all this capability, but they don't tend to use it because they've already line themselves in and sometimes they, you know, put themselves into a position where their goals are so far away, they don't ever think that they can reach them. So, you know, that, yeah. was, that was the second book and, and, uh, and was kind of a little bit more on my own. This is so much more pointed. And, and because of the fact that I've got Chris's backing, uh, with the, uh, the financial planning side of things that he takes care of, you know, it just brings a, a, a little level of specificity and also, um, you know, uh, expertise that, yeah. uh, that he has, you know, my, mine is mainly from a coaching and, you know, just living life and seeing kids on a regular basis, you know, seeing, seeing them struggle with the same things that I struggled with when I was 16, 17, 18 and saying, Hey, here are these five potholes. I already fell in them. Don't fall in them for this reason, this reason, and this reason. And some, some of those, uh, lessons, you know, kids need to learn on their own, but you know, yeah, I, no, and put it out there in front of them as best and I can. You and I have similar goals on that. So I, I always, um, I'm having, you know, having, having four kids and realizing that, you know, you want to, you want to be able to impart things that you've learned that you didn't know at their age. And you just kind of hope that they're, they're able to grasp 
you know, the, what they're meant to grasp, because yes, some things we do have to experience, but I, I agree with you that generational learning is, it's, it's huge. And having adults that care enough to really spend the time to communicate it, I think is invaluable. There's just, there's a lot of noise out there and being able to slow down and have those conversations is just really, really important. So my hat's off to you for, you know, always for trying. And I know it gets through where it's supposed to get through. So yeah, it, it's uh, it's again, you know, you you talk about the noise. It's it's almost like the candy versus broccoli type of thing. It's there's a whole lot of candy out there that you know people are people are uh, able to put out this 30 second video that gets thousands upon thousands, maybe even millions of views, and it's the um, 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 uh, equivalent of emotional candy. But you know, we need a lot more for this younger generation, especially as they are getting bombarded with things, not just, you know, like you and I, uh, when we were kids watching TV, you're getting a commercial every once in a while, but you know, even that we could, we could pretty much ignore a commercial, but they are 100% getting bombarded a hundred percent of the time. And also making sure that, you know, the messages that you're getting are, are good ones. Um, right. you know, it's not just all about the Bugattis and the Lamborghinis and stuff. And that's not the route to happiness, uh, you know, that you can find other ways to make yourself happy without that. So yeah. I tell my 16 year old all the time, stuff does not make you happy. Yes. You know, relationships, experiences, you know, safety is huge. Freedom is a good thing. Um, but stuff is just stuff. And we yeah. quite often have way too much of it. So, yeah, well, you know. As as a language teacher, you know, I teach Spanish. And one of the things that I have really gotten a lot of mileage out of personally and also, you know, whenever I teach it to the kids, um, it's in Spanish. I don't know if you speak, but uh, there's this concept of reflexive verb. So anytime that you do something to yourself, it's a reflexive verb. So when you brush your teeth, it's reflexive. When you brush your hair, it's reflexive. Now, if I put a shirt onto myself, it's the verb ponerse. I put my shirt on. But they also use it in Spanish for emotions. I put sadness onto myself. I put happiness onto myself. And I think that's one of the areas where the English language, we kind of let ourselves down a little bit because of the fact that we think that emotions happen to us, but we are actually creating the emotion for the most part. Is It's the way that we think, the way that we're focusing on things and stuff like that. So we're actually putting the emotions onto ourselves. We think that it's the Bugatti that's going to make us happy, but we're making ourselves happy because we focus on the Bugatti in a particular way. And recognizing that fact is a game changer because then you don't need the thing in order to get there. You can have the feeling before the thing. But if you want the thing still, I'm not judgmental, but at the same time, it's recognize the fact that you don't need that thing in order to feel as good as you particularly want to. And I think that especially me being a father and seeing young people on a regular basis, I, I worry about things like, you know, the drugs and all of that stuff. Even that's to the major like negative end. It's, you know, oh, I need the substance in order to feel good about myself. It's like, yeah, well, it's, it, it is. I mean, it comes a lot of it, it. It does come back to brain chemistry, right? I mean, it's the dopamine effect. It's the things that we, you know, when we're seeking that that pleasure seeking sense that we we have to have something it's the more you understand that stuff i think the better off the better off you are yes my hope is that kids are starting to learn that these things younger i i didn't know the word dopamine when i was 16 and i know that i know my 16 year old knows what dopamine is so i'm hopeful that at least with the things they're being confronted with they're learning more it's more you know there's more active learning around it but yeah it's a scary world as a parent and as yeah. a yeah, well, I mean, you know, when we were kids, there was a TV show, um, the Greatest American Hero. I don't know if you would remember. I remember it. You know, but the concept was he was this guy who had this super suit, but he lost. They didn't give him the directions. I forget exactly what the deal was, but he flies around and basically like crash lands all the time and everything like that. But that's the way the human existence works. Is for the most part. We are here on this planet and we're trying to figure it out as we go along. We weren't given instructions. Most of our parents weren't given instructions on how to do things. And we're doing the best that we can, but we're going to crash land a lot. We're going to mess things up. And unfortunately, you know, with 
all of the attention going to, you know, social media and everything like that. It's, there's a lot more information coming in than, you know, a hundred years ago, 30 years ago or whatever. So now we all need to be at the guard of the gates to our minds. And, you know, I, I talk to my kids, meaning my students or my kids all the time about, you know, the keys. So, you know, who would I trust my keys to? Well, you might trust them to a friend or your brother or something like that, but you wouldn't just throw them to anybody tr walking down the street or give them to somebody you just met on the internet. But we do that all the time with the keys to our mind is giving the ability of somebody to, you know, on social media, say something horrible about you. And all of a sudden that makes you feel horrible, or I didn't get enough likes on this post that I put out there. And so therefore I feel horrible about myself. It's being really careful about who you give the keys to your mind because it can be extremely destructive. And if you're also smart about who you give those keys to, it can be extremely rewarding. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. I love that take. And it's also why I love these longer form interviews. And I encourage people to watch more than just the clips, even though, you know, we we love to clip little pieces of wisdom and put it out there. But there's always so much more behind the longer form conversation and behind like a book like that you've put out or the three books that you've put out. So I really encourage people um, and younger people, especially to really dig into the the, the levels of, of wisdom, because there's a lot more than just the sound bites that are out there and going through your feed so quickly. So, um, but yeah. with that, I, I, there's one question I ask everybody that comes on my podcast really in, in search of generational learning. And it's, you know, if there was a piece of advice that you could give to your younger self, what would that be? Well, uh, I haven't done it in a couple of years because of the fact that, uh, you know, I'm teaching at a different school now. I moved down to Virginia about four years years and change ago. Um, but I used to do a lot of youth speaking and I actually go out, would it go out to schools and basically talk about like, okay, I actually would put up a picture of this is me and this is what I, uh, what I used to look like. And if I could talk to that person right now, here's, here's kind of what I would, would say. And basically, I mean, the overall idea would be, you know, the, your choices make your life. Um, you know, Tom Bill use uh, quote, I, I don't know. He, I, he's the one who I heard say it, but I know that he got it from somebody else's when we're born, we look like our parents. When we're, when we die, we look like our choices. Now I know that's a really like stark st statement. And I know that he gets a little guff for it because of the fact that, you know, people want to make up excuses. But the thing is, is like, you're the one who's in control. I'm in control of my life and I have made choices throughout my 47 years, some good, some not so good, but it's all about the choices that you make and being willing to make a choice and then live with the re repercussions of that choice. And I think that my 16, 15, whatever year old self probably wouldn't get it. So I would probably go more to the, uh, the feeling thing that I talked about, about the reflexive verbs of you put sadness onto yourself. I think I would go that route uh, as a little bit more practical, but really I, I would want the idea to get across that it's all about your choices. Everything that you do comes down to choice. Yep. I couldn't agree with you more. And it's that, you know, we are in charge of ourselves and there's a whole lot of things out there that we can't change, but we are not one of those things. So if you don't like something you're doing, you can change it. And you can also sink into the things that are working for you. And it's, it's, it's a really, it creates a really beautiful path. Not a perfect one, just a good one. So, yep. yeah. Well, I want people to know uh, the best way to, to find you um, and, and buy your book. So what's the best way to do that? Okay. So uh, we have the website set up for eventually to have all the books. But right now, um, it's just the soccer book, but it's uh, sportsfinancellc.com because eventually there's going to be football, basketball, et cetera, volleyball, of course. Uh, but um, as of right now, it's just sportsfinancellc.com. And then uh, we're on Instagram. We're on uh, Facebook, despite the fact that, you know, we talked a little bit negatively about uh, social media. There are positive uh, things uh, out there on social Absolutely. media like that. And, you know, it's, it's a way to get uh, messages out there. So, Yes, we are on both of those uh, platforms. And me personally, if you looked up, look up my name, you're going to find me. 
All right. I'm one of the few Pete Yurks in this world. <laughs> All right. Well, that's good. There's a lot of Joneses in this world. So, <laughs> see. well, I'm glad people know where to find you. I really encourage people to go out and 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 check out your book because this topic is it's really a lot more important than people realize younger in life. So great information for the next generation. And thank you so much for joining me today. Um, this was really fun and let's keep in touch. Thanks. Good to meet you, Wendy. Yeah, you too. Thank you so much for joining us on What I Meant to Say. And um, I'm Wendy Jones, just reminding you to be real, be you, and be better. Thank you for joining us on What I Meant to Say, another production of Inspired Edutainment, brought to you by Be Better Media.